these are actually dwellings, so there's insulation. Um, you know, you can actually um, live in these units. It's not really just for sleeping. Uh, so that's, that's really the, the difference. Now, these are still the semi-permanent uh, dwellings, but we're working to, to really develop systems that can be deployed uh, for low-income housing uh, that have all those attributes, and they're all net zero as well. Uh, but in the interim, right now, what I think there's 70,000 70, homeless in LA County alone, yeah. I think 170 within the state of California. I know the, the mayor is looking to try to get at least 10,000 somehow off the streets. And so there's, yeah, there's a variety of these different types of tiny homes that are out there. There's pellet shelters. Different, um, this one is actually, it's, it's metal construction, so it can't catch fire. Uh, those other pellet shelter villages, I think there's three or four of them that were at 50 to 100 houses burnt to the ground. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I think that's why the mayor wasn't all that excited about going with what uh, she had called tiny homes. But in this particular instance, it, it has a very high fire rating, R value, in this, on these particular units. And the cost is still, in relative terms, very affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have two questions. Um, what is the um, project portfolio? So how many of your, how many projects do you have right now? This is it. So just the Lacrets? That is correct. Right. And then you were talking about a facility somewhere in California. That's in, in Imperial. And that is the, um, going to be the manufacturing facility? Correct. Okay. And, and probably a community as well as just showcase community. Gotcha. And then what supply chain considerations do you have? Well, that's always a question. You know, I've been in the battery business for a long time uh, myself. Um, um, and looking at these types of systems and technologies, if we're looking at the overall systems, of course, battery energy storage and solar panels, which are powering these up, are relatively you know, commodities you can buy off the shelf these days uh, in relative terms, of course. Um, most of them aren't made in the U.S. Most of them are made in Asia and China. Um, that is a concern. That's a, a challenge. Uh, we're trying to work with manufacturers who produce the, the batteries in the U.S. Uh, we're, we're looking at a variety of different kinds of batteries. It doesn't just have to be lithium, although <coughs> we think that that's a superior choice. Um, if possible, you know, lithium iron phosphate, that's ones that are designed for energy storage, not for EV applications, like they said, the ones that catch on fire. Uh, so those would be uh, used in homes for safety purposes. The other materials that go into this, uh, like the light gauge steel is actually, uh, that's all recycled steel uh, that it goes into that process. So um, that we think is, is very interesting. And these other materials that we've looked at um, that are using, like I mentioned, this other um, Moxie technology uh, material. That is also all uh, uh, sustainable materials, actually uh, CO2 negative technology. So those, that's a biomass material, lignans. They're byproducts in the paper industry. 95% of it's just burned <laughs> going forward. So, so that material is readily available for, for that application. Do you have a price point for um, one structure? Right. It depends on what you would like in the structure, but they, they range from twenty five to 65,000, depending on how, how many batteries you want to put in it, <laughs> which ger generally brings the cost up. But, but in most cases, they average around 30, 35,000 with solar and batteries. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, plumbing. How do you manage Always a good uh, question, water right? And sewer. Okay, our our, our partner is a contractor plumber, so that's that's the answer to that question. No, <laughs> there's there's three ways to handle it. Uh, so gray water is always the, the issue in these types of units, of course, and so we can either treat it ourselves, where we put in a septic tank, we can connect it to a sewer line if it's close enough, uh, or we bring in portable systems that we would maintain ourselves. So. 
pretty much you know standard practices out there, but that's the that's what we're doing. That's the game plan moving forward. And the operation and maintenance is on the municipality where they're located, or how do those damaged air conditioners get replaced? <laughs> right. Well, ho hopefully they'll they'll hire a good service contractor. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank All right. you. Right. Thank you. Restaurants, food service, gonna make you guys think about uh, your next cup of coffee or espresso or toasted bagel. Next time you go out to a restaurant a little bit differently. So uh, my name is Todd Bell. I'm with Frontier Energy. My office is up in uh, San Ramon, up in NorCal, Food Service Technology Center. Anybody heard of the Food Service Technology Center? Yes. Cool. That's all I need. <laughs> the rest of you, good. I get to... But no, it's actually good because if you had heard about it, you'd be like, this, I don't even watch, see these slides. So yeah, I'll talk to you about what the Food Service Technology Center is and then uh, move into the, the meat of the presentation, which is basically uh, electric plug, lo plug loads in the commercial food service industry. And why are they basically a problem, right? Where all these, uh, where, where's all the juice going? So again, my name's Todd um, Bell. I'm a senior program manager with Frontier Energy. I am presenting on behalf of Edward who is one of our senior engineers at the center. Edward came out down with a nasty case of COVID. I'd never heard of that, bef some illness before, but he came down with it. He's got, so he's on the recovery, but he's got a nasty cough. So I figured I would uh, step into the breach and uh, take over the presentation for him. Just a little bit of information on myself. I have uh, been with Frontier Energy Food Service Technology Center since 1998. I was a lab technician for about three and a half, four years, running our standardized test methods in the lab on the equipment. So I kind of come from that technical background. And then I moved into more of our customer facing work, working uh, very closely with a lot of our utility partners, especially the customer account reps, doing energy audits, design consultations and things of that nature, as well as our educational uh, program that we run in partnership with the, with the utilities as well as our uh, private contracts that we have with front, through front end energy with the, with the industry of all shapes and sizes. So, um, yeah, Frontier Energy Food Service Tech Center, fishnick.com. Some people go, fishnick.com, what, what is that? Uh, fishnick.com is a holdover from our legacy company, which was Fisher Nickel Inc. And that uh, company, so the founders were Don Fisher and Judy Nickel, and they decided in 2012, after 30 years of being the principals of that company, they wanted to retire. So they sold the company to uh, GTI, which is Gas Technology International, which in turn turned around and formed Frontier Energy, which, which is a multi-unit, we have eight offices throughout the United States focused on energy efficiency, not only in the commercial uh, market segment, but residential and industrial fields. So, uh, we kind of dabble in all things energy efficiency and water efficiency too. But again, the Food Service Technology Center, we focus on the commercial food service game as well as residential as well. So, but that's Fisher Nickel, uh, fishnick.com. Um, we've been kind of lucky because as an office, we've been able to hold on to that uh, as our URL for our, for our website. And uh, I'll be referring to that at the end of the presentation because we've got some resources posted there on that site. So. What is a food service technology center, you might ask? The foundation of it, the, the heart of the beast is our test lab. And we basically genera generate standardized test methods to evaluate the cooking performance, energy use of a wide range of uh, uh, commercial cooking appliances and uh, wear washing equipment. And so to date, we have about 40 test methods. So we look at, well, let's see, what's under the hood here? You can see in the lab on the left side, we've got a bunch of, looks like some fryer testing was going on that particular week when that picture was taken. And then over on the right side, we're uh, testing combination ovens and convection ovens. If you went in there today, you'd probably see some gas, uh, let's see, gas ranges in there. And I think we've got some griddles that we're testing. So it's, we're just always cycling through different pieces of equipment testing it for the manufacturers, either they're looking to have it uh, uh, qualify for Energy Star or utility rebates that are offered for energy efficient equipment. In California, we have a very robust, robust instant rebate program for different categories that uh, are utilized by not only Pacific Gas and Electric Company, but SoCal Gas, San Diego Gas and Electric, 
in SoCal Edison. And there are many municipalities uh, like SMUD, uh, LA uh, Water and Power has a similar program as well. Um, Alameda Power too refers to the basically the qualified products list that we generate as a result of the testing and the equipment that we do. But basically think of us as road and track of the industry. So the whole reason behind the Food Service Technology Center at its inception back in 1985-86 when Don and Judy were working with a small team of engineers, uh, contracted with PG&E, um, got going because the account rep for Safeway ran out of things to offer Safeway in terms of energy savings. They said, hey, we've covered refrigeration, we've covered the HVAC, but all, you know, one of my largest customers here has all these delis and all these cooking appliances, and I don't know anything. Don, Judy, what can you teach me? What can we learn? Like Don, you know, had some experience doing uh, ventilation testing on the exhaust side. So he's familiar with these kitchens. And so working with uh, PG&E, they penciled out an 18 month research project to just monitor the equipment in one of PG&E's large uh, cafeterias in San Ramon, which is actually a stone th throw away from our offices. And then um, that evolved into developing these standardized test methods. Uh, after 18 months, pg was kind of, hey, this is really important information. And the program, again, grew out into the physical facility that is the Food Service Technology Center today. So um, again, people ask, oh, do you guys go out and buy the equipment? No, typically we're having it sent to us from the manufacturers who are looking to, again, see if it's gonna qualify for Energy Star or get the rebates. Uh, there's a co-funded um, funding, uh, um, method whereby the utilities are helping to offset the cost of that testing because they want their customers to make informed purchasing decisions and ultimately purchase more energy efficient equipment. So it's a pretty good arrangement between manufacturers, ourselves, and the utilities to promote energy efficiency in this market, uh, market segment. We also test exhaust hoods. This is a picture of our ventilation test lab. Uh, here we have uh, Rich who's doing um, some testing on, oh, I don't know what manufacturer this is, but an exhaust hood. We have a flow visualization camera here where we can actually see the heat coming off of the equipment and dial in these exhaust hoods to the optimal exhaust flow rate and you know, evaluate the different tweaks that manufacturers make to their designs. You know, additions of side panels, how the um, makeup air is introduced into the space or from the hood itself. Uh, again, it's all designed to test the, the hoods and see how well they're capturing and containing the heat that's coming off of the cooking appliances and ultimately operate these hoods at lower exhaust volumes, which in turn uses less energy. Uh, myself again, I'm out there doing a lot of these energy audits, walking through kitchens and helping uh, our utility customers reduce their energy use through the selection of more efficient equipment or just by implementing best practices, you know, startup and shutdown schedules, turning off the conveyor toaster as <laughs> you'll see the value of just doing that to a small mom and pop shop can really add up to big savings. Uh, fixing leaks, startup and shutdown schedules and things of that nature. And then of course when folks are doing remodels, building out new kitchens, we can go through their plan set and help them select you know, more energy efficient makes and models of equipment and factor that into their purchasing decisions. And of course on-site metering, right? We don't live in a bubble in the lab. You know, we can model equipment based on our test data, but we wanna make sure that those numbers that we generate based on that lab testing actually matches up to what's going on in the real world. So we'll go out and, you know, throw, throw CTs onto a panel, put small, small gas, you know, basically utility grade gas meters in line on uh, gas equipment and get that real world data to, to back up what we're doing in the lab and just also inform the customer to the real co operating costs of the equipment that they're running. And this kind of work is what fed into the plug load study that we did with the California Energy Commission about uh, three, four years ago. And also it makes up the, the bulk of my presentation here and the, and the numbers. And so why do we care about these plug loads in commercial food service? It's like, eh, you know, it's just a toaster. It's just a tea brewer. Like I said, you're gonna go into, you know, we experience food service restaurants on a daily basis. Whether you go to Starbucks or Pete's Coffee, you know, I, go into, I don't go to McDonald's often, but if you got a hankering for fries and you're like, I'm going to the drive-thru, right? Well, 
a typical McDonald's has almost 300 pieces of individual pieces of equipment, and the vast majority of those are electric plug loads, right? And you think of how many McDonald's, and you start to add up the numbers of equipment that's out there, it's a pretty staggering number that's just kicking along, no controls, right? Because at home, we got, you know, the, the computer at 50 watts. It goes to sleep, 2 watts. Ah, that's not a whole lot. Well, there's a lot of computers out in the world. Uh, light bulb, you know, incandescent. Nobody, hopefully nobody has an incandescent <laughs> lamps out there anymore. However, I do drive my, my wife a little bananas because every time we go out to eat, first thing I do when I walk into a place, I look up, I look at the lights. You know, I'm trying to, you know, open kitchens. I'm seeing what kind of cooking appliances they have. I go into all sorts of places. Like, you know, recently it's been a lot of elementary schools and, you know, where was I recently? Yeah, uh, it was at Albany Unified School District. You go in a lot of supply cl T12s. T12s are alive and well. So just so you know, it's, uh, they are alive and well. Incandescent lamps, I see them all. You go into walk-in coolers and freezers and stuff, you will still find the 100-watt incandescent uh, light bulb in there from time to time. Um, I've found 250-watt heat lamps in walk-in freezers, which blows my mind. It's always a treasure hunt. I love my job because you just never know what you're going to find. But uh, yeah, so, but even, you know, you got your 12 watt uh, LED, but you flip the switch, it's off, right? No energy is being used. There's no standby energy use, you know, but I do, you know, chase my wife around the house all the time. Turn off the lights, I don't care about these kind of watt LEDs. But you go into a kitchen and you really can't even see what's going on. Well, okay, you're thinking, oh, okay, Todd, I see some lights, great. Yeah, those, those are probably LED or maybe some T8s, probably not T12s, we hope. Ah, but that's not a lot of energy, but what we're actually looking at here is the kitchen pass heat strip right here. Check that guy. That's 870 watts. Just clicking along. Keeping, uh, let's say, it looks like a hotel pan full of bacon. And yes, you need to keep the bacon warm, but you're pushing almost 1,000 watts. This uh, particular kitchen here is uh, in a hotel and the room service, so that is on all the time, right? And that's just that small four to five foot section right there. Again, you, it's hard to tell that it's actually on. It's not like there's some warning light that's saying, hey, hello, I'm on, right? You, looking here, you, you can't, it's just a radiant, you know, resistive cattle rod that's uh, heating the bacon. You know, easy to forget that it's actually on. And it's actually, and it's all hitting all that heat load into the space too, so that's hitting the AC. <coughs> so, pretty big load. Now let's play some where's Waldo and how, or how many pieces of, how many plug loads are in this picture? Any guesses? Uh, let's take, who thinks it's uh, three? <laughs> there you go, okay. It's a high number. If it was that bad, we'd, yeah, the, the grid would have crashed by now. But, okay, so I got three, how about five? Seven, seven. we'll say seven. Anybody above seven? Nine? Nine, nine. okay, we'll go with nine. I can't remember, so we're going to find out together. <laughs> so we've got one, and that is a, that's a panini press hanging under here. That's about 1,000, that's actually about 1,200 watts, panini press. Uh, then we've got a soup warmer. Uh, that's actually for the uh, warm syrup that we love for our waffles. There's three. There's a conveyor toaster. There's another heat strip. So it's four, five, another heat strip. Six, seven, eight. We got nine pieces of equipment on that line. So yeah, we got all the heat strips there. And an average restaurant is easily 10, 10 or 11. Parasitic just plug loads. And this, and this is just the pass. This is just going from the kitchen hotline through to the, to the waiter who's gonna take it out to, uh, to the dining room. You don't have all the other appliances. If we turned around and look at the line itself, there could be additional electric appliances there as well. So again, it really starts to add up. Huge, huge loads associated with uh, restaurants. I work with a lot of folks that have thought it was their dream. I'm gonna open up a restaurant when I retire. Do not open up a restaurant when you retire. I beg you, right? Be a consultant like myself or on the periphery of it because the bill shows up and they get, it's 2,500 bucks a month in the winter when there's no AC loads and they're like, oh my God, and the rates are lower, 
right? By the summertime, that's another thousand bucks on top of that. You're talking thirty-five hundred to four thousand dollars a month. It will, it can break you quickly, along with all the other things. So restaurants, extremely, very, very expensive to operate. Um, yeah, it's it's a real chore and ch to just keep the doors open when you've got all the utility costs, uh, especially now, right? Peak peak pricing four to nine electricity rates. It's always shocking when I update myself on pg e rates that you're at 32 cents a kilowatt hour during the peak, right? So it's, it's uh, really bad. Now, the CEC funded plug load study was designed to go in and actually take, build on what we had learned in the lab because we had spent time running standardized test methods at all this different equipment, but we wanted to see, okay, what, how is it being used in the field? What are the load profiles? When are people using this equipment? And so it was looking at uh, 20 plus sites of a wide range of equipment types to see what in the world was going on. Um, the first piece that we looked at, and this is a little backwards on the slides, we were looking at uh, hot, uh, basically hot tops, resistive uh, French plates, okay, resistive coil, um, and coming in and replacing it with induction. I do apologize for the wonkiness of the slide order. Anybody have induction at home? Yes, awesome. Anybody? Uh, thinking about getting induction. Yes, you're thinking about it, awesome. I don't know if they have any loaner programs down here in SoCal. We run one for PG&E. Yes. There is, awesome. P induction is fantastic. I basically use a little single hob on top of my gas range and I don't use my gas range at all anymore. But um, induction, if you're not familiar with the technology itself, Highly energy efficient is basically you're running an electric current through a copper coil, creates an electromagnetic field. You're exciting the molecules of the pan directly with this oscillating current. Uh, the, the induction unit and the pan act like a system. So when you take away the pan, the heat, you're removing the actual heat source. So the induction hob stops using any energy. Uh, your energy transfer is above 85% to the cookware itself, and that's based on, we do we have a standardized water boil test. We get two and a half gallons of water into a pot, turn on the unit, boil the until a boil, and we figure out how much energy went into the induction hot top, right? And then ultimately how much energy was actually transferred to the water in the pot, and we find that it's above 85%. A lot of units are actually 90% energy efficient, which is crazy, crazy good. Um, Electric re electric resistance, okay, 75%, but performance is junk, right? Because it takes a long time to heat up that pan through conduction, and then ultimately that energy, right, has to get into the water. Again, the induction is great because the pan itself becomes the heat source, um, which makes it even more efficient. Electric resistance is slow to respond to control inputs, whereas induction is pretty much automatic, right? And those folks that have induction have seen that at home. It's just really cool. Gas, enemy number one, um, all sorts of stuff that, yeah, um, higher CO2 impact. Energy efficiency wise, only 35%. That means that 65% of the energy that's going into your gas burner is completely wasted. It's not doing any useful work. It's barely getting into the water that's being boiled. And then of course you have all the, you know, the NOx issues and all the indoor air quality uh, with a gas open burner range top. So yeah, gas, I mean, it's, it's yesterday's technology for sure. So, um, so it's really cool to see the induction coming online on the commercial and the residential side. Uh, going to the work that we did on the on-site monitoring, you can see the baseline. It was again, just a resistive French plate type uh, that was looking at annual energy cost of $1,000, whereas the induction was down at 400. And then you can just see that difference in energy daily energy use, really s quite significant. Uh, other benefits of the induction, easy to clean, take away the pot, surface cools down almost uh, uh, very, very quickly. There's just a residual heat. You know, an electric uh, burner takes a long time to cool down, still pr uh, can cause, is quite a hazard. I learned that as a young child when I reached up on the, <laughs> the stove and burnt my fingertips, and you only do that once when you're four and you never do it again. So uh, there's that benefit. And then the radiant heat load to space is zero, which is pretty amazing, right? So that helps reduce that uh, heat load to space and your air conditioning costs and staff comfort is really important too. 
So induction is just a fantastic technology. Other applications uh, where we can put induction soup wells to solve 49% savings over a resistive type. Basically, um, in the soup well, the coil is wrapped around the vessel that the, or the insert uh, itself. And then you have a steam table, right, which you put the steam pans into, into the steam table here, right? And then you, you take them away. A traditional steam table actually has water in the steam table. It's being uh, boiled in that tr to create the steam to heat your steam pans. So you take away the water, you don't have to worry about cleanup, the hassle of that, uh, and again, just uh, far better, uh, just far more energy efficient. Any questions about induction? Uh, kind of a, one of the last frontiers on induction is going to be large, uh, full-scale uh, Chinese woks. Right, we're starting to see some manufacturers enter those, introduce those to the marketplace, which is pretty cool, because that's a pretty big gas gas load. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Do, well, I think we should just let's just do it so we keep it. Kind of and I can hear you. Okay, two things. One, one, I'm a big fan of induction of course I've, I've had it and there's other benefits that I that I'll probably I'll just say one cleanliness uh, all around all around the kitchen not just in the surfaces okay which is which was a which was a, uh, a benefit that I did, uh, didn't expect but it was amazing I think there's um, and I researched this but it hasn't been researched enough I don't think which is has to do with the with the um, um, combustion gases that are created at the interface between the pan and the and the flame that result in some volatiles that get stuck to throughout your kitchen which uh, are pretty nasty to clean it's almost impossible to clean right. and I, I, didn't, I didn't inspect that and that's uh, I was like where is this coming from you know it wasn't oil it wasn't oil because oil is easy to remove but it, and it's not grease it, it's something else and and I found out empirically what it was but and then I researched it after but anyways that was one on that one question regarding ventilation and induction or electric cooking for, for that matter. I know that a percentage of the, of the ventilation is, is related to the exhaust of, of, of cooking oils and things that are essentially coming off the food. And another one is heat, right, or heat, heat extraction. Is there, are, are there measurable savings between the exhaust requirements on cooking with electric or induction and, and gas that are make a significant impact or, or an impact? It can, but again, it's based on the cooking process. So the amount of basically smoke and heat that's being generated by that appliance. So an electric fryer, an electric grill, or gas fryer and gas, uh, gas fryer and uh, electric fryer, they're creating the same heat pressure and steam as both. So you have to have the same uh, ventilation Just because you just because you go to electric doesn't necessarily mean that you can bring that exhaust volume down. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that so if I'm say doing a real gre you know heavy grease uh, frying on a induction pan and I'm creating that same cooking effluent plume, it doesn't as I would with gas. My ventilation rates I I they can still be considered heavy duty or medium to heavy duty appliances, regardless of which is the challenge. So what we try to work with is eliminating those really heavy duty pieces of equipment like the under fire charboiler completely, um, working with more efficient appliances like combination ovens, go to smaller cook lines. Just so there's, yeah. Where you get the benefits from induction is that radiant heat load to space that has a lesser impact on the air conditioning. But the, but the exhaust volumes typically can, can potentially have to stay the same. And there's a whole other discussion on residential, on homes and exhaust hoods and that, because your home exhaust hood doesn't work very well, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and that's why having gas ranges is, yeah, as you're found, decided, yeah. Right. I know, it just sends, because your exhaust hood at your home is not capturing very well. It's kind of, it's probably getting, 
at best 60 percent of the cooking effluent. The rest of it's just <laughs> you know, and a lot of it has to do with we don't have sufficient makeup air or replacement air in our homes. Whereas restaurants, commercial food service kitchens have dedicated replacement makeup air, so you're not suck, you're not creating a vacuum basically that causes it. You know, not causes, but uh, okay. Um, smart sensor technologies moving on to the conveyor toasters. You know your bagels, your toast. You know uh, spend the uh, you know, home with sweets or, you know, spend it, say, America or your holiday express. You go down for your bagel in the morning. You're probably going to see something on the left as opposed to we're hoping to get to the smarter toasters on the right, okay? So the one on the right actually has a set automatic setback feature. It can sense when toasting hasn't happened for a while, and it'll uh, cause the elements to go to a lesser input rate. So we saw in there, you know, going from 60 kilowatt hours to 30. So that's uh, 10 uh, megawatt hours per year savings based on the total population of these conveyor toasters out there in uh, in California. Uh, re replacement program or a replacement project that we did, you can see the savings, uh, the different, and these are the cooking profiles or operating profiles that we are generating with this, uh, with the research, and you can see the, uh, the blue line is the traditional unit that just Turned on, 1600 watts, they turned it off at about two in the afternoon, five, it got turned on again for a few hours and they finally shut it off around seven o'clock. With the more advanced conveyor toaster, the red, right? It's basically heavy toasting conditions there in the morning where you would expect things kind of slow down. You know, late morning after about seven o'clock when the toaster went to that set, to a lower setting, there was some in incidental toasting going on and then there was another uh, pretty, another hour event of consi con uh, consistent toasting. But you can see it's basically matching, uh, you know, usage, right? Which is pretty impressive. So in there we saw 24% energy savings. The lowly coffee brewer, right? Here's definitely a parasitic plug load that just sits there all day, doesn't get uh, turned off. Many of the modern units do have setback features. But as we know, things don't get commissioned. They just get put on the counter, plugged in, they make coffee. That's all I need to know. Customers are happy. They've got coffee. There will not be a riot. Well, you know, if you don't commission it properly, it's just good. Right, this is going all the time. Versus if I go with that model that, you know, most, like I said, most models do have setback features now. If I program it, you can just see, right, really big reduction in energy use. Now, $55 might not seem like a lot, but you know, a typical Denny's will have about four to five of these. Then you think of one franchisee that might have 20 stores, 20 restaurants, then you think all the Denny's in the world or Coco's or whatever it might be. Um, it really starts to add up. So pretty big savings there. Then you just have the simple tea brewer. Cook along and idle most of the day. This thing only had really one brewing event. In the middle of the day at nine in the morning and then the rest of the day, it was just left on. Okay, they made the tea, they're good to go. But it's never got really turned off. Now, if we were to turn that off, there's 120 bucks a year, just with a little bit of programming. And this particular bun model does have an energy setback feature on it. But the owner didn't know about it. He was just happy that it was making tea. But then when the bill shows up and he's going, why is, why, you know, between the 100 extra 120 bucks and everything else going in there, on in his store, he's wondering, gee, where, where are all my profits going? Well, your profits are going to these, to an appliance that hasn't been commissioned yet. Right, so 100 buck savings per year, better to have it in your pocket than go into the utility, right? How many people had some espresso to make this morning? Yeah, people are, people are like, oh yeah, right? I saw tomorrow you will uh, go to your favorite coffee shop, hopefully a couple, hopefully that God shot, you'll be all happy, happy. So, most espresso machines are left on all the time, okay? Because they're told, oh, if you turn it off, the seals will expand and contract and it'll fail, and so the p owners are like, oh, never turn it off. Well, manufacturers are finally putting in smart controls so that they can be just turn off automatically. So this is a pretty busy uh, coffee shop. So between eight, eight and eight, 12 hours a day, pulling lots of shots, it's really the heart of their business. But they got into quite a few hours where it's just clicking along, not doing anything, you know, averaging about 500 watts and idle. Then you come in with one that has a uh, control feature on it. 
that's over 200 bucks a year in operating cost savings. You know, in some places, you know, it could have a couple three group units. So it can add up pretty quickly. And we also always have to remember that that additional heat, that heat is not only just going into the boiler, it's ending up out in the space. So that was kind of, uh, talks about a, a lot of the pieces of equipment that we looked at. There are a lot of external controls that we can employ with this equipment, um, especially for your 120 volt uh, <coughs> plugged uh, uh, units. So yeah, cheap, accessible, versatile, downsides can be, can't, you know, might not be super precise. Programmability errors though, you have to commission them properly, right? That's always the key. And uh, matching, you know, operations. Could maybe we are, our serving times changed. Maybe we, we used to have a brunch service on Sundays and now we're saying, oh, you know, we're not gonna do that anymore. Or we're not doing breakfast or maybe we're just become a dinner place or something like that. That can happen. We wanna make sure that we're always going back and reprogramming that equipment and those controls. Uh, simple things, you know, that we always see are a benefit to these appliances beyond controls is insulation, insulation, insulation for sure. You know, less heat loss is required. So manufacturers, just by virtue of certain uh, energy standards, have to um, uh, use insulation. We saw insulation combined into this three group espresso machine. So that makes 65% energy reduction. You know, the th on the left, granted, t California Title 20 has pretty much outlawed those, <laughs> but they're still out there in the world. I'll go into school sometimes and I'm like, oh my gosh, why do you have this uninsulated hot food cabinet, right? versus you want the efficient model on the right, and hopefully it's ENERGY STAR rated and maybe receives a uh, utility rebate. So again, big savings just by better design and use of insulation. So big bad slide with a bunch of numbers, but the kind of the key takeaway here is the uh, 51 uh, gigawatt hour savings if we just took the entire population of all this equipment <coughs> based on our uh, market surveys, right? So it's pretty, pretty huge and you can just see the amount uh, the types of equipment that you can shove into a restaurant food service operation you know institutional kitchen it's kind of endless you go to the food show like national restaurant association show that's coming up here in may or the one that just happened in florida called natham you walk you can walk the floor for days and just amazed at the type of equipment that is being made right you can just uh, do just about anything so uh key takeaways right need to uh, eliminate Minimize energy use, not used. Uh, we want smart technologies like induction, highly e energy efficient, things that have uh, sensors and timers. Um, insulation can be uh, underused, right? And the energy savings needs to be automatic. You kind of want to, you got to take the human out of the equation, right? Can't count on the staff to turn it off. You know, that, yes, shut down, uh, start shut down schedules are great, but we have so much churn in this industry that the guy that was here last week, he could be down the street working for a couple bucks more an hour, you know, tomorrow. So it's a really big challenge. On fishnick.com, on the website, you're going to find our CEC report, all sorts of stuff here as well. We got the advanced uh, conveyor toasters, we got the uh, induction two former analysis report, all kinds of good stuff. So check it out at fishnick.com. I always tell people if you forget one thing from the whole presentation, just fishnick.com and you're good to go. So next steps for us as we continue this work is investigate the market gaps or potential saving opportunities. Uh, heat lamps, not really any effective controls out there work uh, right now. So we're trying to push manufacturers in that direction, incentivize uh, plug load savings and increase associated market demand. So education is always huge as well as working with utilities for rebate programs to get people to buy equipment that has controls and gives that savings. And then we're also looking at other types of equipment from sealers and slicers and, and processors. Like I said, the amount of equipment that's out, out there is almost endless and we've kind of just scratched the surface after 35 years. So here's how we can help, all kinds of stuff there. And then I'm gonna say, if you happen to be a researcher, your utility, you wanna continue, I'm, of course, you can always reach out to me um, and Edward as well. He's our, our lead uh, senior engineer at the Food Service Technology Center spearheading this work. So hopefully I didn't, okay, I didn't get us quite back on schedule, but I tried questions about induction and everything. So anyway, thank you, thank you for your time. I appreciate it.
up here. <laughs> um, hi everyone, I'm Ann Davis. I'm happy to be here to wrap up uh, this huge variety of topics today. Um, uh, we're going to switch gears into some residential uh, uh, customers here. And I think this is a good bookend to what Kim talked about this morning. We'll bring up some of the same topics, so we'll, we'll really round things out. What we're um, talking about today is LADWP customers' gaming console energy usage and efficiency. So today I'll talk about our project um, background, specifically what we did, highlight some of our key findings that we had, go through some of our details, and wrap things up about what we hope to do next. And really, I'm up here just re representing a large group of people. Lots of people came together. The project first started um, from an article by Nora, Noah Horowitz, um, and where he was saying that uh, gaming consoles represent a sort of vampire energy usage. It's a, it's a vampire device. So that kind of spurred LADWP to investigate this and came together to form the Gaming Standby Energy Load Ad Hoc Committee made up of uh, various groups including LADWP, CTA, Microsoft, and CalPlug. And later on, some of the manufacturers got involved, uh, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. And the first informational need that was identified was to understand customers' um, understanding, knowledge, opinions of that um, energy efficiency of the gaming console in the home. So the goal overall is to impact change in how customers are using their gaming console in order to save energy. And there were three things that we wanted to investigate. Their perceptions and attitudes about their home energy usage, including the gaming console, measure their interest in reducing their energy usage in the house and thus their utility bill amount, and gain, in, gain insights into how attitudes and behaviors differ across some uh, groups of our customers that we were talking to. We started with some qualitative work where we talked to uh, LADWP uh, bill payers and gamers in the household. This could be uh, one and the same person, or uh, we talked to pairs of people um, to include uh, both the rate, the bill payer, and the actual gamer. Then we designed our survey, pre-tested it, and did a uh, quantitative study. And that's what we'll primarily be talking about here today is the quantitative study that we did. It was a study done online just about a year ago. And I want to talk specifically about who we were talking to. Um, it was a specific group of, group of people. These were LADWP customers. They had to have some responsibility for the energy decisions in the household. They had to have some responsibility for paying the LADWP bill. Uh, and we wanted to exclude 
some people who might act a little bit differently, so we ex excluded those who had solar panels and we excluded those who might be in the industry. Additionally, they had to, in someone in the household uh, used a gaming console or hybrid gaming console um, and this person we were talking to had to have at least some influence into the power settings of that home gaming console. So generally speaking, we refer to these people as energy console influencers. Okay, so th th this is a specific group of people we're talking about. So just to hit some of our high points we'll be talking about. Um, so first, their perceptions of the energy usage of the gaming console, people don't tend to think about <laughs> the specific energy usage of the console. They're thinking about the energy usage in their home overall. And primarily, they put the responsibility of producing energy efficient devices on the manufacturer, which is something Kim mentioned first thing this morning, right? So we're finding the same thing. They expect the manufacturer to be developing energy efficient um, devices for them. But when we talk about who is the person in the household, most likely to take action, to change their behavior, to save energy, it's not the person who's the primary gamer in the household. It tends to be um, uh, the, a non-user in the household who's motivated to decrease the energy um, usage in order to save money on their bill. Uh, as we would anticipate, that primary console user is really thinking about um, gaming performance. That's their priority. So really, the point here is LADWP has the ability to speak directly with the person who will change behavior, right? Talking to the gamer isn't always going to be a solution for change. And that's something that um, LADWP can really take action with. So let's look at the console usage um, and the users uh, of home gaming consoles. First, again, we require them to have um, at least some influence in the um, home gaming console power setting, 58% had reported complete influence in that setting, and then 42% had significant or some influence, okay? Then their familiarity of the home, um, the power settings on the gaming console, pretty spread across in terms of familiarity. And the degree of the console, degree of console usage in the home by this individual we were talking to, right? So they didn't have to be the user, they only had to be familiar um, uh, with the power settings, or have influence, excuse me, on the power setting. So 36% were also the primary gamer. Another third were kind of a secondary or um, minimal user of the console, and another rough third um, are not a user of that console, all right? So let's look at who these people are. Uh, the primary user tends to be a younger single male. Their focus is the gaming experience. Energy usage of the console is really not a priority for them. It doesn't enter into their decision uh, when they're thinking about their next gaming console purchase. But the person who is not a console user in the home, they're, um, they tend to be lower income, older females, less familiar with the gaming console. They have a greater concern for the energy usage 
of the household overall, as well as specifically that gaming console, because the gaming console is being heavily used. And the energy usage of that console is going to play into their next purchase. They're motivated to save money on their um, utility bills. So let's talk about streaming from the console. And when I say streaming here, I'm talking about streaming TV, movies. Uh, I'm not talking about streaming gameplay. And we made that clear to um, the respondents we were talking to. So the proportion of streaming in their household that is done from the console is what we're talking about. 36% don't stream from their console. 44% stream somewhere between uh, 1 to 49% of their household streaming is from the console. And 15% is 50 to 99%. Just 4% are always streaming from that console, right? Now this is important because when we're streaming from a home gaming console, that's a higher energy usage than if we were streaming from a dedicated streaming device, okay? So on average, this is about 31% of uh, streaming in a home is on the home gaming console. And these people at this end that are streaming more heavily, more uh, greater proportion of their streaming in the household from the home gaming console are um, less likely to have alternate ways to do it. They don't have a smart TV or another dedicated device to be able to um, stream from. Okay, we asked them of course about, you know, what brands of consoles are in their home there's a little bit of a difference, um, likely driven by the um, devices themselves, differences across devices in terms of how they're used, what their capabilities are. Um, PlayStation users are ten tend to be more likely to report that their console is already on the power saving mode. Um, streaming is done fairly similarly across uh, PlayStation and Xbox. Nintendo um, users are more likely to use that console for gaming only. Um, they're, uh, al they're also likely to have a dedicated streaming device that they're streaming from. So just some differences that happen uh, um, across those uh, users. So in terms of the perceptions of the household and console energy usage, like I said, um, when we spoke with people, they're not, they're not really thinking a lot of the time about specifically the, the energy usage of the console itself. Um, we had uh, one LADWP customer talking about, well, you know, what I notice is seasonally in the summer when it's hot, that's when my bill goes up and it's because of air conditioner. That's what I am concerned about. But we also spoke with um, a pair, uh, I think it was a dad and a teenage son, and the son was talking about all these things in his bedroom that use energy. He had monitors, computers, lights around his room, and he said, it, you know, it's just total electricity all over his room. So even he was recognizing you know, this is a lot just in my room. So you have varying degrees of um, thinking about the usage of the console, but it's not always specifically the console itself. So let's see if we can put this into some perspective then. How much energy is used? So if we use what is put forth in Noah Horowitz's article, and we look at Xbox, um, if we switched it to an instant, from an instant on to an energy saving mode, um, we could save nine watts of power or 78 kilowatts in a year. 
31 million kilowatt hours or 7.6 million dollars in a year across all of LA or across the country we could save 4 billion kilowatt hours over the next five years or 500 million dollars in energy costs. So you know it's it's all exponential on an individual basis and we've talked about all of this in various areas um, all throughout today but we know that it just builds and builds uh, and we can see that here. So just putting it in another light we can see that um, it's equivalent to 54 million miles driven by cars, 2,700 2, homes energy usage for a year, over 7,000 7, tons of waste recycled, 365,000 tree seedlings grown for 10 years. So it just becomes a lot. So the importance of energy saving benefits to customers. Um, what are uh, customers thinking of in terms of their home game and console? What are those um, benefits that are important to them? So firstly, the Im what's the impact of uh, changing your console to the power saving mode? Does it reduce console performance? And 47% said no, making that switch, it's not going to impact my console performance. But 27% say yeah, it, it is. And so what are they thinking? So some say, well, they think it's going to impact their startup, right? So it won't start quickly, it's not going to save where I left off. Um, so there, that's one uh, thinking about why it would impact. But others seem to think, well, it's going to actually impact gameplay. So there's some erroneous beliefs about making that switch that um, are held by, by about a quarter of people. Then we presented people with some different um, benefits of console functions and we wanted to see, well, where do some of these energy saving benefits stack in terms of uh, importance of gaming functions? And what we see is, you know, up top, of course, we have to have optimal game playing experience, right? Given. But then just below that, some of these uh, energy saving benefits are right up there. So shuts down automatically, has a power saving mode, has settings that maximize energy efficiency, right? So when put to people like this, it, it's important. Um, so it, it's part of what people are considering when considering a home gaming console. And where are they going to go to as a source of information when they are searching for that next purchase of their home gaming system? And firstly, they're going to go to their um, console manufacturers to find out, you know, what's the energy usage of that console. And then some will turn to some online sources, but then also to their utility company. They'll turn to LADWP for information on that. So again, LADWP comes a, becomes a source of information and a way to communicate uh, with customers. And uh, so this is what we were talking about in terms of, well, customers are really placing importance of the energy efficiency on the manufacturer. Um, 62% say it's, it's extremely important that the manufacturer is developing energy efficient uh, gaming consoles. Um, a full 84% are on the high end of that scale, really depending on manufacturers to do that. And then remember we've talked about the issue of streaming from the gaming console using a higher amount of energy. 
Now, we wanted to see, well, are people going to change their behavior if they, if they understood this? So what we told them was, okay, research has shown that streaming TV or movies from a gaming console uses about 10 times more energy than streaming from devices like Apple TV, Roku, or an Amazon Fire Stick. So when we told them that, 74% uh, said they're very or moderately likely to change their behavior, to s change how they're streaming from their gaming console. So quite a lot of people are willing to make that change if they could just understand that energy usage of the device. So who are these people who are willing to make this change? Well, they have other devices, right? So as long as they have other devices, it's, it's easy to make that change, right? Um, and energy functions in the console are important to them, and they're more concerned about the energy usage of the console in the household. Now, conversely, these people on the other end, um, they're less likely to have other um, devices to stream, stream from, they're doing more of their streaming from their console. It's just harder for them to just make that change. Um, and the ability to stream from the console, it's an important function to them. And interestingly, the, these two groups are equivalent in terms of their regard for the energy usage while streaming. So it, it's just, you know, it's equally important to them, but they're just constrained by their situation on this end. So moving forward, um, it's really LADWP's goal as the largest municipal utility in the nation to serve as a catalyst here um, to bring about more energy efficiency and sustainability in, um, and inspire change among their customers and work together with manufacturers to develop goals and attain these goals to um, uh, be more sustainable and energy efficient for the future. All right, thank you. Um. Yeah, that could be for your 120 volt appliances, like the plug loads that I was talking about, potentially. Um, but w with the heavier duty main cooking platforms, like the gas, the range, right? The equivalent needs to be a 208 volt, so it's you're you know you're talking 50 plus amps. So the loads are significantly higher for sure. Um, yeah, so load shedding on a, on a battery could be challenging. To date, for load shedding, where we really only have some options is with ice machines. So people can, you know, we have some programmability. There's a company called Manitowoc you may be familiar with. Um, they make an ice machine. They actually have a nice interface. So you can tell it when to make ice. And so obviously you're trying to make it off peak. Um, but yeah, it's, it is very challenging to, to load shed a lot of this equipment, and especially when you want to, because people are with peak service <laughs> during, you know, your dinner service, you know, four to nine, and especially for, uh, you know, we're talking about restaurants, it's hard, you can't just shut down a lot of stuff. But when we talk about the, the battery load shedding, you know, it would probably be these smaller plug loads that you're talking about. And then that incorporation into like induction stuff, so we, the smaller units, um, yeah, they, they could have a place in a restaurant, say if you had buffet line or things like that, and just a lot of lighter duty. But the main hotline, if it goes all electric, it's a much higher, yeah, much higher loads, which could be difficult to, to offset. And that is a question for you. And that oh, is, um, so, so. I would say, I don't have this question. I'm the tip of the spear of a great engineering team. So <laughs> follow up with questions. Two words, demand charge, right? I yes. saw, I saw that. So, yeah, yep. you, you know it. You know I was going to ask yeah, it. So, right. yep. yeah. So, that, talking about demand charge and the cost, right? Your cost per kW. So, most 
most restaurants, even though they get lumped into a small business utility rate, they're actually a medium to large business customer. So you would have your, yeah, you get the additional, not only the unit energy cost, KWH, but demand charge, which can be quite significant. PG&E is up during the peak is about $20 per KW. So pretty big. So that's why we're trying to always educate people about that four to nine peak period when things get really ugly. Um, you know, it used to be noon to six and some people are still under the, oh, it's noon to six. No, no, it's right. It's four to four to nine, <laughs> but yeah, demand charges, it can kill a business. Oh, to when to sh when to load shift? So yeah, like during the long day last year, we had a yeah. huge storm and we got some of the first hours and then we had some later hours. Oh, right. You would ideally want to try to s have that cycle uh, not during the peak when the cost is the highest for sure. But yeah, correct. Right, whenever it's set. But you would want to ideally set it in the period yeah, it's the lesser charge. Well, because well, I'm sorry. You, yeah, you have your you have your maximum peak that's set at any time of day, and then you have your peak load. So we're trying to get people not to to minimize that um, maximum peak set during the peak, because you have your daily peak right at any point in time, and then you would have the more peak periods. So, but yeah, the maximum peak set at any time is a challenge. You talked about your product manufacturers coming to you for testing to make sure that they meet a specification. I just want some clarity around that. So um, are you developing the specification and are you developing the tests? So the question is about uh, testing and certification. So on for the ASTM test methods that we develop, we're working in hand in hand with industry. So we have an F26 committee at ASTM that basically gets together with Edward and my other colleague and my our our general manager David Zerbowski, and they come they work on those standardized test methods. So we're not working in a vacuum and throwing out crazy stuff. <laughs> so so ASTM and we develop the test method and then it's certified ratified by ASTM. So they have complete ownership of it. We are a Cal ISO, we're, I'm sorry, we're an ISO certified laboratory. So, um, and then, but any other lab that's ISO certified in the country can run those test methods. Um, the, for uh, Energy Star, we worked with the EPA and an another large consulting firm as a sub subcontractor, ICF. And basically, we were the, one, the the technical horsepower behind the development of the Energy Star categories, with which there's what, twelve to twelve today, yeah. Um, and then for the the rebates that the utilities offer, yeah, we're we're basically helping to develop new working papers to establish, you know, what the baseline energy usage and what an efficient uh, unit's energy usage is and what that delta is. And again, we're just working as the uh, technical horsepower in the development of those working papers with the utilities. So are, are you working with, I'm just say like Wendy's, do they come to you and talk to you and push the market forward? I basically, I'm wondering who's pushing the energy efficiency, um, um, yeah, who's pushing the energy efficiency in kitchen equipment? Yeah, so, t so typically the big driver is you would have a manufacturer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but you're getting some exercise. Oh, this is good. <laughs> um, you're ready to go to Wendy's after this. Um, yeah, so bas typically the way we would be working would be you would have, say, an end user who's going through uh, like a Wendy's or a McDonald's or like a Safeway, and they're going through a purchase cycle. So take like uh, Safeway. When they go out to buy new rack ovens, they might, they're going to say Blodgett or um, uh, other manufacturers 
Felshaw, whoever it might be, and they're saying, hey, we want to know what the energy consumption is of this equipment. We would like you to send it to the ASTM t a or to the Food Service Technology Center or another ISO accredited lab that can run that standardized test method for rack ovens. And then so we know what your energy use of, of the oven is. So that's one route. It's coming from the end user. Um, the, and they're basically, again, telling the man or the manufacturers are coming to us beforehand because they want, for marketing purposes, to get the, a uh, the, the Energy Star listing. Or, as money talks, they want to get the utility rebate. Because not only do we have the rebates available to many California utilities, like the instant uh, rebate program here in the state of California, and you can find information on that through the California Energy Wise uh, website, um, but you also have the municipalities that have the rebates, like uh, LA Water and Power does, right? They have um, similar rebates that are uh, backed up, again, by the, uh, the testing that we do in the qualified products list. But the instant rebate programs is also in uh, nine other states, um, East Coast, uh, Oregon, Washington. And that is administered by a company called uh, Energy Solutions. And so we're the technical resource or subcontractor to energy solutions to do that testing and all the equipment stuff. So in that, uh, so in other other states. So you could have a manufacturer again wanting to get the rebate or the Energy Star uh, listing, or they might be in the R and D phase, just looking at new, um, you know, uh, technologies into their equipment, and they work with us and you know hang out in our lab with their engineers and ours, and you know we. To, you know, help uh, make more energy efficient equipment. But the big drivers are the big players, the big purchasers. So think McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King's, you know, the large restaurant groups that are buying a lot of this equipment and they really recognize the value of that energy savings, right? Because it really adds up when you have multiple units. I'm, I'm sorry to make this the cooking show, but I have another <laughs> question for you. Um, when we were developing our electrification future study scenarios, we had to make judgment calls about you know, what's gonna motivate people, and sometimes it was that they had to be motivated by climate change. In the case of induction cooking, it just seems sort of inevitable when you think about the performance benefits and the energy savings and, and all of it put together. I'm just curious if you can comment on sort of what you've seen or heard in terms of resistance to that switching. Um, what might be a barrier for customers, especially in commercial kitchens? Yeah, so the biggest up barrier to uptake of induction is that there isn't any fire. <laughs> There's no flame. It gets a very, you're right? So the open burner gas range, we all like fire. It goes back to our caveman roots, right? Well, but uh, traditional cooking, especially, you know, your most restaurants, where it's uh, casual dining, fine dining, you know, even your... You know, tech campus cafes, you know, you're going to have a six burner range or you might have a couple of those chefs, cooks, that's how they're trained. So it's a, a very traditionally based um, and being that you have the visual um, of that flame hype and just how you the working with it, flashing of a different, you know, if you're on saute or whatever. So, again, it's just technology that's been around forever. Right um, now, it's not just and that's why with induction, the training is really important. And we find, after they've come through our kitchen and worked with our consultant executive chef, Mark Dusler, we turn them to the light pretty quickly because the performance is there. Because th often in this industry, we talk about BTUs. I need 35,000 BTUs per hour per, you know, for every burner, I more BTUs. Well, you need all those BTUs because this equipment is only 35% energy efficient, right? You don't, and so with induction, you're actually doing a similar amount of work with less KW8, KW, right? Kilowatt hours, just be by virtue of it's so much more efficient. And so once you get the chefs and the cooks in front of this equipment and they get that hands-on experience, they're like, oh, this is really cool. And that it's not hot to work on in front of, it has excellent temperature control, easy to clean, lots of labor savings. So again, it's, those are the really important aspects. So you can't just throw the equipment into a kitchen and say, here, we're gonna, we're, it's electric and there, take it. You just need to have that you know, discussion with the people that are in front of it. But once you spend that time and that education and give them the chance to get some hands on, we usually find that it's like, oh, I wish I had had this years and years ago. <laughs> Actually, just a quick follow-up question to uh, to your question, which is, I know you were talking a little bit on um, entities like McDonald's and Wendy's and, 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 and fast food restaurants like that. 
question for you is, um, what about uh, in cities like 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 a Vegas buffet, right? Like though, like obviously those are entities that serve people all day, every day at high volume, and they just keep churning, keep churning, keep churning. But they're also in Vegas, so their energy cost is a little bit different, and they also have an idea of what turning a profit is. The food is an afterthought to what their real profit is. I'm just interested interested to see if anybody has ever thought about that or um, talked about that. Yeah, so we've had some experience with like Southwest Natural Gas, who I believe, yeah, they're in the in the casino business. Um, but yeah, it, it, the the equipment purchases numbers are actually significantly less in relation to say like the chains. It's it, right, that's the big driver. Just who's, but we have had some experience with some of the casinos that yeah, that is an important aspect of their business. So they do tend to specify more energy efficient equipment. Equipment now whether they're going the electrification route and stuff uh, that's a whole other discussion. But they do tend to understand that yeah, just based on the volume that it is the payback for them is really quick. Spending an extra two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars on an energy efficient fryer, it's going to pay for itself in less than a year, right? So yeah, um, but yeah, you're right. It, I've been to many Indian casinos in the state, and some of them are the flip kitchens. You walk in, you're like, holy cow! <laughs> so they're big. So. Yeah, this is, uh, if it's turning into a cooking show, you know, I think we'll get hungry <laughs> fairly soon. So <laughs> I'm going I'm to change, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the conversation. And, uh, and it's actually to you, Therese, and to you, Vince, you know, um, you talked about the EcoBlock microgrid. And Vince, you talked about a similar hydrogen microgrid in the Netherlands. Is there any opportunity for third parties to kind of be able to, you know, compare and contrast these two totally different vision that, that that's out there and look at what is uh, economically and technically more appropriate for that particular region in the world? Who want to talk first? Yeah, I, I, I th yes, I, I think I think there is because, like I, I mentioned, um, we we when we were looking into precedents for EcoBlock, we saw a lot of new residential, right? Uh, and uh, if it's single family, it's it's new construction, right? If it's um, if it's a retrofit, there's the um, what's the Bronzeville or something in in um, Chicago or something. It, it, it's industrial and it's multifamily and, and commercial, right? So we didn't find any precedence for what we wanted to do, which was single family retrofit. And and I think precedents are great because you learn like what did you, we're always calling people and saying what did you do? How did you do that? What did you which uh, you know what rule did you use or or, or you know what uh, what uh, what technique did you use or whatever? We're always looking for that. So so the answer I think is yes. You know we're always looking for opportunities to learn from each other and to try to figure out how to collaborate with others who are doing something similar. <laughs> well, I think on the hydrogen front, right, the, the United States is way behind other places. Right? In Europe, in the UK, there's been a number of studies. A good example is Keele University, right, where the entire university campus injected 20% hydrogen in, into their gas infrastructure. There's some very nice reports on that. That, that have come out because they did this, you know, many years ago now. Um, the, the one of the things that I thought was was very interesting, and and this has been discussed here a couple of times, is the uh, get like getting out ahead of like what's happening as far as like the communication, right? For public to adopt either of these ideas, right? The education and public awareness is, is very important. And uh, that Keele University study, they have a very nice report on their, their strategies for you know, how to 
to go out and do that. But the, the public, right, they're, they're suspicious of utilities, right? And, and wh whether it's electricity or right, demand charges, net metering, <laughs> whether it's the gas utility, right? That for, for everybody to have kind of a win-win, right? That, that communication is really important. And, and we're seeing more and more of these studies. There's a number in Canada, right? So it'd be, it'd be behoove us to like consolidate kind of those lessons learned as we move forward here. Um, this is a question for Therese regarding the eco block. Um, I was curious about the shared EV kind of financial structure and ownership structure behind that. Um, I wonder if you can speak more about that. Sure, I, I'm not the expert. Tim Lipman at the T uh, Transportation Sustainability Research Center would be the, the main guy to talk to. But we're working with known entities. So there's a company called, we were working with Envoy that was going to be the handler, basically, of that shared EV. And um, for, um, I won't say why, but, but we, we've moved on from them and working with a company called Mio Car, M I O Car. And, and these are companies that they do car share. And so they, they know what the, um, there, there's an app and you can, you know, schedule when you want to use it and there's a fee for using it. Um, and there's, uh, and, and that c they cover the maintenance and the, tr um, uh, uh, you know, insurance and things like that. So there's a structure for that. Um, Meocar, I think, is mostly, um, they're, they're looking directly for underserved customers. And so their cost was something like $4 an hour, which we thought was absurdly low. And I think Envoy was more on the uh, 12 to 15 or something like that an hour to use the car. So, so we're using their structures. We're not creating anything new there. We asked the block um, to consider between three and six. And it is this is in very urban Oakland. And they said, how about one? <laughs> And so we said, let's start with one, and then if it works out, we can move on from that. But they were, and, and even some people were like, how about none? Um, so it, we, we're going to start with one and see how that goes. And I think as more and more people get electric vehicles, then I think it'll grow. But we have to start somewhere. So we were happy with one. We would wanted more, but we'll take one. Well, I should say it's um, one EV charger. It's a dual port, so we can charge two cars. Right on the street, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, self doubt. For, for the gaming console, yeah. did brand loyalty really? Uh, all right, for the gaming console, did brand loyalty play any factor in that? Um, because certain titles are only available on certain consoles. So, did that cause? They, they don't seem to be quite interchangeable, that I would go buy the more energy efficient one but it didn't have the titles I wanted, so I wouldn't go buy it. Um, did, did that play any factor into it at all? I don't remember exactly where it fell in our kind of list of important things, but it was down a little bit lower in terms of uh, has the specific choice of games I want um, was below kind of that first group of you know optimal gameplay and then those first few um, energy efficient things that were important to them and then down a little bit lower was it has my specific games I want to play so it, it certainly does enter into their choice but it's not their initial primary concern, although you certainly know people who are going out and buying this console because it has this game, so. Um, y that's a great question. I don't think at this time in 2023 people are like so brand specific. 
like if you go back maybe 30 years, 35 years, you're like, oh man, I'm sorry, man, I can't roll with the Genesis. I'm, I'm gonna go with the Super Nintendo. That's just how it's gonna be, period, in the story. My friend has that, my cousin has that, my, my you know, all, that just, that's just it. Now more than that, th now more than not, people have multiple systems. And so that's not really necessarily a big hang up. When I saw those numbers, when Ann and the team did it, and, and I can speak for the rest of the team as well, we were kind of surprised to see that energy efficiency was, that was in the top five. We just really wanted to know, you know, here in Los Angeles, second largest city in the United States of America, is this something that's interesting to people? Do they care about that? D you know, this is not, you know, I, I got family from the Midwest, but this ain't Topeka, Kansas. This is LA. So I was thinking of the mentality, no one really cares about that. Our viewpoint for making sure that we did this was to make sure that one, we can actually go back and have an honest conversation with the manufacturers and say, hey, we, we, we talk to people that are your uh, customers or potential customers that are in the second largest city in the United States of America in a major metropolitan market. This is what they're thinking. This is what they're saying. I think it's important for you to notice that. Second of all, it was important for us to be able to have a conversation with us to be able to say, especially our sustainability team to say, we, we wanna make sure that we're engaging in this type of conversation and doing so at scale. How can we do that? The fact of the matter is, is that the gaming manufacturers customers are our customers as well, but no one was talking to each other. New York Times has a great article right at the start of the pandemic or right during the middle of the pandemic that talked a lot about how parents, grandparents, aunties, uncles are letting their kids play games for extended amount of time. And I think that's also what kind of pushed Noah Horowitz to write that article. And what really got me interested as well was that's why people were really utilizing it much, much, much more during the pandemic. But you know, the days of when Dr. Lee was rolling around and playing Centipede, that's over now, right? I love Centipede, by the way, that's over. Uh, the gaming systems are real entertainment machines. And so my grandmother now watches Grey's Anatomy on an Xbox, it's weird, but she does. <laughs> that's real, that's important to note because now I didn't, I, I didn't know that, that there was much more energy usage off of streaming than actually playing the game. That's important to note. So these are the kind of conversations that we should be having and having at scale. Thank you. Okay, that's great, because that's a great segue to my question. Um, I'm wondering what kind of conversations and what your plan is. So it was on the next steps and um, talk to the manufacturers and work with the manufacturers. So I'm wondering if you have a plan put in place or what are you all thinking about next steps, are you going to put in some kind of incentive program? Um, how are you gonna encourage the manufacturers to create energy efficient um, gaming consoles? Oh, I'm sorry, I am so <laughs> rude, dude. I'm so rude, because it's five o'clock and I know y'all are hungry, and it's like, look, yo, I'm trying to get up out of here. I apologize for y'all. Um, I'm Ty Washington, I'm the Executive Assistant General Manager uh, at DWP. Um, so thank you again for having us, we really appreciate that. Uh, to answer your question, I, I think that was the whole reason why our sustainable sustainability team put together an ad hoc committee to be able to have these kind of conversations. I don't think necessarily our goal is to I don't think we just have the ability to be able to do kind of incentive programs in that regard. H here's something I am thinking about. Um, again, did this research and I was happy and honored to do this research. And from that, we, we learned that the United Nations has a program called Playing for the Planet. It's essentially a UN program that is specifically and specialized around uh, gaming in regards to sustainable uh, practices. Here's the interesting thing. Not one energy entity or company is on their list. Why is that? Your gaming entity, you need power from us. Your customers need our power. 
to utilize your systems, why aren't we part of that conversation? These are the things that we need to start having a conversation about. We should be at the table having that conversation. Let me say that again. We should be at the table having that conversation. And what does that look like? I, I just, I just was, that's just crazy to me. But I think that the next step is for us to be able to, you know, galvanize and take this on a road show and then be able to have more conversations like this about what we, what we did. And eventually we would love to be able to partner with the United Nations and, and, and be able to, to hopefully one day cross fingers, we could sign on to playing for the planet, which would allow the Department of Water and Power to be able to talk about sustainable practices at a much larger scale. We have a fantastic team that's very knowledgeable and has the know-how and knows about this. And we really want to make sure that we're engaging in that in a very holistic approach. But to be able to do that, you have to be able to kind of have that kind of conversation. And so it's kind of weird to me that energy entities like us aren't like that. But real quick, Dr. Lee, we're the government. We're a government entity. So it's kind of weird. People don't usually talk to the government. When the government calls and says, hey, we want to talk to you, yeah, the people kind of shrink up with that, right? You get it. Like, you know, wait, what do you really want to talk to me about? No, no, I really want to talk to you, but what do you want to talk to me about? We understand that. That's called self-awareness. We understand that when we as a government entity call a, 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 a conglomerate, what do you want to talk about? And we want to talk about partnership, and then we really mean that. So that's kind of something that we're also going to have to uh, get through as well. Thank you. I, I think there's an opportunity on the ESG, environment, society, and governments uh, program and uh, incentivize big corporation to really work on this kind of program. Uh, <laughs> You can also game and stream on a computer. Is there good data uh, comparing the total energy use that people are uh, expending on consoles to the amount of time that they're using a computer for the same purpose? I was just going to add, uh, thanks for asking, I, I was going to ask that question, but um, because having a, well, an, old, an adult uh, man now in my house, that, or that used to be in my house, that uh, is my son, that used to play a uh, game, uh, and, uh, and his friends that do the same thing, I, it is a more significant consumer of electricity, I think, uh, these uh, computers, they're super, they're like just mega computers that they build, and uh, liquid, you know, cooled, uh, you know, CPUs, all sorts of, and, and video cards, they're, they're, they're heaters, they're running, I mean, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of watts um, uh, a piece. And, and to add to just to add to that is, I mean, I guess it's a future study or so, uh, it's an enhancement to the study when you want to take this into the road, in the, in the road, because this is a real thing. I mean, everybody that I know, all the kids and that are growing up and doing this, then they're not playing in their consoles anymore. So um, it is an important load, of course, as you've, as you've exemplified, but this is an equally or even bigger load, I would probably think. Um,
That's correct. Multitask, yeah. You can do homework, do homework as well, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, um, and I guess crypto mining is also probably happening in these machines, uh, so which is another, you know, multi multifaceted uh, energy suck. Any other questions? If not, I think it's, uh, it's about time to, uh, to uh, wrap up today's uh, workshop. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the speaker for your great presentation and we got a lot of inspiration from you. I'm so happy to see the face change. Since we have, uh, in the past, I always thought is the people sitting in the front is all the males. But today, like in the morning, everyone are different with different gender. I, I am so happy to see our society is moving in that direction, especially fighting the climate change, right? And sustainability become the top priority. And we may need to look for different workforce. And they are the great one to really help us to lift the tide to solve this uh, climate change problem. Thank you. So uh, it's the time for the, uh, uh, the uh, network reception with a live dinner. So please join me in the atrium. Thank you. <laughs>